Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I didn't know what the audience would be. I uh, decided to assume nothing. Uh, so apologies to the people for whom this is going to be a rerun of, you know, but <coughs> maybe, maybe everybody will see something new, at least a cartoon or something. And, and this, this, uh, this, this doesn't work. So, okay. So I'm going to begin with the absolute basics and take us through. And I'm going to give a very, very fast, very high level overview of this whole area of interactive uh, coding, which I hope will play some role in as we build in sort of engineering solutions to how to do re stuff in real time in distributed settings. But this is really just going to be a theory talk, and we can maybe in response to questions, we can get into how things would, you know, uh, play into application areas. But uh, coding theory begins with Shannon, uh, memorialized nicely here in uh, by a, a stamp about Alexander Graham Bell, um, <clears throat> saying you know using the first electronic communication system. Uh, these are of course uh, very noisy. So uh, the question that came up, you know, already before Shannon, was um, how do we deal with um, errors? Um, but there are sort of two questions that come in tandem, and, uh, and Shannon was really the one to connect them. So the, the really trivial question is just, well, no noise at all. Uh, I have a channel that can, submit, can transmit one bit at a time. How long does it take me to send n bits? This is a trivial question. It takes you time n. But then the somewhat less trivial question is, um, uh, you know, just sort of maybe, maybe this is almost a modeling question. Um, having uh, to understanding that like our, our, our fundamental idea of a noisy channel, the most, the simplest maybe model uh, is a, 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 stoch a, a channel with stochastic noise. And the simplest thing is you should think of n memoryless noise. Of course, information theory has gone way beyond this. So for, but in case, you know, people really haven't seen these basic things, this is the, the simplest, most basic model of a noisy channel. You have an input that's a zero or a one. And then with probability, epsilon might flip that before it comes out the other end at the, at the receiver. It's called a binary symmetric channel with uh, parameter epsilon. And uh, it's not the easiest channel to deal with, but it's maybe the simplest to talk about. And um, how do you encode a single bit so that um, you get very low probability of error? Well, you just take your bit and repeat it many, many times. Okay, so that's called the repetition code. And if you want to get exponentially small error probability, then this is a basic large deviation bound that the, the right amount of time is uh, linear in n. Okay. Um, so Shannon um, asked, well, what if I don't have one you know, bit to send, but many? I have n bits to send, so I have a source that's generating sort of a lot of data, n bits. Uh, that's my message. Uh, I have a, a, a transmitter. And now this whole block of bits is going to go across the channel and be affected by noise. Right, so this is the, sort of the noise hitting the channel. And then there's a receiver. And the receiver gets to sort of decode before the message is actually used at its destination. And the question now is when I have a lot of bits, how does this problem scale up? The kind of trivial answer is, well, you can just still take your bits and code them one at a time. and then. That will make you, if you have n bits and you want to get error probability e to the minus n for each one of them, then your total communication time will go up to n squared, uh, which is not so nice because you have this, um, the rate, the you know, bits per unit time is going, going to zero. Um, up till Shannon, that was uh, what people knew, but that's you know, really not the right scaling. And Shannon's insight, uh, you know, one way, nice way of thinking about it is that there's just a lot, a lot of room in high dimension, okay? And there's so much room that you don't really have to pay separately, except in the constants, um, for both sending many bits and uh, getting um, very low error probability. And this is, uh, in a nutshell, Than Shannon's theorem, that for any uh, positive alpha, um, there's a code that converts a message of length n to, well, there's two ways to think of it. You can still think of a binary alphabet in, in many characters. And in this case, I, it can be easier to think about sort of large finite alphabets, in which case it doesn't matter. You can just keep n the same. Um, and uh, this code will have the property that's nonetheless, the distance between code words is still 
uh, this constant fraction alpha of n. So you can get the same up to constants, the same um, behavior you got for the repetition code, uh, even though you actually have exponentially many code words and not just two. So that's what's summarized in points A and B here. There's a rate guarantee. You're sending your bits across at positive rate, which is basically one over log of the size of the alphabet, and the error guarantee it being uh, exponentially small probability of error. So this is fine and classic and, you know, the, 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 the bedrock of information of coding theory. Uh, for the situation when you have a long message right at the start, as in the diagram of Shannon's, and um, you get to encode it before shipping it across. That's um, not a real-time kind of a problem, though. And this method, which is called block coding, um, isn't useful, isn't, isn't, you can't apply it if the data is being generated in real time. And in this talk, I will discuss three uh, situations um, in order of difficulty in which data is actually generated in real time. The scenario one is sort of um, that with respect to the, that the, with respect to the transmitter, the transmitter is sort of passive. So somehow this, this data is actually being generated in real time from outside of the transmitter by some um, exogenous sort of source of data. So the um, the uh, you know the data you know the encoding in your cell phone treats your human speech as some exotic you know it doesn't it doesn't try and speak <laughs> for you it waits to hear what you said and transmits some version of that and in fact in cell phones we we do use uh, something called convolutional codes which is a sort of a quasi well it's, it's a real time code um, it's it's not a very sophisticated one in the sense that the actual block length being used the actual error probabilities are not very low which is fine for just dealing with something uh, like human speech. Um, so, but it doesn't, this, this kind of simple approach doesn't really scale up to getting you sort of arbitrary exponentials. The more kind of sophisticated scenario too in which we deal with data being generated on the fly is a, can ha occur w uh, not for exogenous regions, for, um, you know, you sort of have a, a self, uh, a closed system, but. Um, but you still have this issue of essentially messages being generated on the fly. And that is where you're trying to um, implement over uh, noisy channels um, uh, the communications uh, designed for a noiseless channel uh, that were going to be run in an interactive communication protocol. Okay, so now you have two processors. Um, uh, so this is the basic scenario of communication complexity. For those of you who are not uh, theorists, this might be new. The, the basic model for communication complexity is there are two processors. Each one of them receives a, one of these two inputs. There are two inputs, x and y. One party receives x, the other party re receives y. They would like to compute some function f of x and y, and people with communication complexity have a library of favorite functions to, to worry about. And um, for the purpose of this talk, those two parties are going to be called Calvin and the Librarian. I will argue these should be their historic names, and not, not, uh, not Alice and Bob, but Calvin and the Librarian. So um, these two processors have between them a physical channel. And in each round of their interaction, there's uh, one character from the alphabet sigma can, can, can fly. And they just exchange. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to worry about and, and people do worry about these things. We're not going to worry about what happens, you know, if we don't alternate turns or if we have some physical channel which can somehow, like, you know, wireless, we, you can somehow set signals going both ways. I'm not going to worry about those things. We have dedicated channel, and I'm not going to worry about, for most of the talk, I won't say anything about constants. So it doesn't matter that we give each of them a separate round and so forth. Okay? So, uh, and the goal at the end of the protocol, just what does it mean to succeed? It means that Calvin learns the value of this function f of x and y. Okay, and the and we want to minimize the number of bits that are uh, that have to be communicated in order to to achieve this. Um, you notice what the the main thing about this problem is that um, the amount of communication required could be much much less than that required to transmit y. Right? There's a sort of a trivial solution where uh, the librarian ships over all of y. But that's, that's not the solution uh, that's interesting. Um, you, often you can get by with, with much less. Uh, and this same setting you know, comes up in distributed controls. If you have several processors trying to coordinate what they're doing, um, 
but they're also continually receiving you know, their own fresh data. That's more of an exogenous situation. Okay, so this is the, the basic problem. And um, it's named the Calvin um, and the Librarian problem by me, I guess I should admit, uh, because of this. Okay, so, so if you'll look here at one of the classics of 20th century literature, um, uh, we have Calvin, this is Calvin, uh, calling the county library uh, and asking for the reference desk and saying, uh, well, I, I need a word definition. And uh, this is like one of those cartoons, you don't hear the voice of the librarian kind of squeaking in the background. Uh, but the librarian, uh, but then Calvin responds, well, see, that's the problem. I don't know how to spell the word, um, and I'm not allowed to say it. Um, could you just rattle off all the swear words you know, and then I'll stop you when, um, okay, hello, hello, and see if I ever vote for their tax levies. Okay, so, um, so what's, what's the problem uh, that Calvin has uh, here? So um, what's the sensible protocol for learning the definition uh, of the word? Um, so here's a little bipartite graph I'm going to sort of illustrate to you in a way. Not really a bipartite graph, but anyway, here's a, here's a diagram. Uh, there, are, there are all the words um, of, of the English language, suitably uh, broaden to include the kind of words Calvin is interested in. And, and, and here are all the word definitions. You know, they're served down here. And the sensible protocol uh, looks like this. Um, Calvin says his word, darn. Um, and then the librarian responds with a definition. For example, yeah. that's not <laughs> quite a, I mean, that's taking us further afield, but, but that's not a word definition. So, how would, how, so what's the librarian supposed to respond with? So, hmm? so yes, yes, very, 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 very good, very <laughs> good. Day. This is this is what Calvin probably did not have in mind, but um, since this is a PG talk, um, so the the librarian you know could re, could respond with this with this response. This would be the sensible protocol, um, but Calvin can't implement it for the reasons described uh, previously. Um, so instead, Calvin would like uh, to implement the following protocol. <laughs> where the librarian just says all these unspeakable things um, and he just listens to, okay. So this is, this is now you can see that this is, uh, besides being more entertaining, a much more communication intensive uh, protocol, right? So it's a much slower way uh, of obtaining eventually, uh, of Calvin eventually learning f of x and y, where x is, x is, x is just the word darn and, and y is actually this entire database down here. Okay, so um, so Papandreou and Sipsa were interested in the Calvin and the librarian problem, although they, uh, as I checked recently, were not aware of its true origin. Um, uh, and they proved the following theorem: uh, for all k greater equal to two, for infinitely many um, uh, t, there's a communication problem that if you allow yourself k rounds of communication. Um, you can solve it very quickly with just, uh, or very few, very little communication, just k times log t uh, bits. Um, but if you um, insist on using only, uh, only k minus one rounds of communication, it, require, it, it requires essentially a, an exponential blow up uh, in uh, a number of, of bits of communication. You go from the log t to, to, to t. Okay, and they, uh, they proved this for the case k equals two, which is exactly the example I gave you of Calvin librarian, and then they conjectured this for, for all k, and then it was proven a few, a few, later, a few years later. Okay? Yes? Do you have average case versions or where you have a distribution over inputs? Um, no, I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about that. Um, I, I have to think, and maybe not. Uh, and a few years later, um, so this is all for deterministic uh, protocols, but the same, the same thing holds for even if the protocols, it, there's the same, the same round gap um, if you, even if you allow randomization of the protocols. Okay, so the, the, the kind of the outtake from, from all this is that you really, in order to be efficient in communication, really need to have a high level of interaction, even if there's not, no issue of exogenous, you know, real-time sources of data, it just, it's an inherent it's an inherent uh, obstacle in communication theory, and you really need to be able to 
to, to, to do have very highly interactive protocols for some problems. Which is bringing us to the problem um, of how to do error correction uh, for general interactive protocols. The naive solution is to apply the standard classical Shannon block coding <laughs> to every round, but as we just saw, those in order for the communications to have been efficient for the noses protocol, those rounds might have had to have been very short. Okay? But that defeats the whole kind of deep idea under, under underlying uh, uh, block coding idea, which is that you need your messages to themselves be long in order to sneak in the error correction along with the, the communication. So, uh, and that would require us to slow down the communications by, uh, uh, you know, we would get the same kind of quadratic slowdown that we uh, talked about uh, in the trivial solution. But there is a way to uh, avoid this problem, it's just that block coding is not that way. Um, so there is a theorem that goes like this. Uh, I give you an arbitrary, you know, interactive protocol that terminates within T transmissions uh, for, any, for any pair of inputs. It may be completely interactive, so it may use, in fact, T rounds of communication, just as it's using T uh, bits. And uh, we can talk about either kind of error model, and we'll talk about uh, both of these during the talk. One is adversarial noise, that there's an adversary who just goes in and uh, is sort of can choose some alpha fraction of the bits to flip uh, whenever he chooses to. Or there's the more um, um, the gentler and still quite useful case of random noise or stochastic channel, which is like the binary symmetric channel that we saw before. Um, and either way you get, so of course the random noise is easier to deal with, but either way you get a theorem that looks like this. Uh, well, there's two theorems, uh, sort of a randomized protocol, deterministic protocol, that says that um, there's a, the first one says if you use shared randomness, you can still use just a linear uh, number of transmissions, so you're, you're sort of working at constant rate. You have finite alphabet channel, so we're not cheating in terms of the size of the alphabet, and uh, achieves error probability that goes down. Um, it's not quite e to the minus t, although that's been achieved by now, but at the time it's e to the minus t over poly log t, um, and is also computationally efficient. This is with shared randomness. And the main ingredient in the proof, and I'm mentioning these sort of old results because we have better results nowadays, but actually many of the methods uh, the, the, what well, we'll be talking about this, uh, come, you know, or persist. So the, the main idea here is that once no, you sort of do your communications, uh, as you, as if where everything were noiseless, and once in a while you pause and you, you can send hashes of, of your entire transcript. And, uh, you compare these hashes and if you need to, you sort of backtrack and in order to, the, the hardest part of this whole business is sort of synchronizing the two processes. When you back up, um, you know, what, what part of our history are we issuing a hash, are we hashing now? You know, so that, that's the main problem is the synchronization. So you have this sort of binary hierarchy of checkpoints. That's in, you know, 30 seconds, the, how, the, how the kind of hashing method works. So that's one method that, that people use till today uh, for this kind of um, problem. And it requires randomness for the hashing. And there's another kind of class of solutions that doesn't work that way at all. Um, and it uh, gives you a deterministic protocol. Um, and again, it works at constant rate, so the total number of transmissions is still linear in, in the original uh, number of transmissions, and uh, still uses its fine alphabet, so we're still not cheating. Um, it uh, works both in the adversarial and the random noise case, so this was just, uh, this old result was just stochastic noise. This works also in adversarial noise. Uh, up to some noise threshold, which at the time was 1 over 240, or else it achieves exponentially small error probability. And here the method is quite different and um, is based upon a new class of, well, now it's 23 years old, but a uh, class of codes called tree codes, which I'll say a little bit about. Um, and then on top of the tree code, so, this is, so you can think of this as like, since we have some networks people in the room, there's like a different layers. So there's a code layer, which is tree codes, and then there's a simulation protocol that rides on top of that. So you, you have to kind of put these two together. So this is kind of where this business starts. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do now in this talk, time permitting, who's my chairman and how much? I don't have a chairman. Okay, I'll just talk. Over here. 20, 20 minutes into your talk. Okay, thank you. 
I'm going to talk about mainly the structure of the talk from now on is going to be, okay, we, so, so this is where we, so where we start, and now there are roughly five major kind of research directions that people have taken this since then. I'm, I'm going to give some kind of an idea of what, what, what has happened um, and where things might go. And I'm going to, there's a, there's a lot of papers here. I'm, I'm not going to mention most of them, or, or I might mention them like this, where, you know. Um, uh, but I'm just going to single out a few, a few what I think are kind of key results and, and tell you what, what's been happening. So, um, so one thing, which was a, a great paper, is this result by Braverman and Rao um, five years ago, where they dealt with this deterministic protocols, and they um, were interested in the noise threshold against an adversary. So 100, 200, 1 over 240 is a constant. Um, so I was, you know, we can all be very happy with that, but it's not clearly the right constant. And they made a huge leap and got us basically to the right constant. Now, asking whether it is exactly the right constant begins to depend on details. Um, I mean, it, because there's maybe some factor of two at stake depending on whether you're binary alphabets and this and that, so I won't get into that. But they, but they basically got us to the right regime and probably the right answer, certainly the right answer in some models and maybe the right answer in others um, for the error threshold. So, so it's an incredible kind of statement. You can be sitting here doing your one bit at a time interaction. An adversary can corrupt anything less than one quarter of your channel transmissions and you still will your protocol will still succeed okay and notice that um, you know if, if the adversary went, went up to a half you could just block all the transmissions from one of the parties okay so so we're um, so we're, we're sort of at the uh, and if and if he only goes not to w one half but to one quarter he can flip half of the bits of one of the parties which means that that party is essentially sending no information so you can see why this is sort of the right answer so, um, so they uh, get this, except that, um, except that, uh, whoops, except that, um, yeah, not, not except anything. Okay, that's the, that's the result. Okay, so this, per, this solution, uh, I just described to you this kind of protocol layer uh, description in the previous slide of the old result. Um, this simulation, this, this theorem, I should say, re respect that structure, it leaves tree codes intact and it uses a completely different simulation protocol writing on top of the tree codes. It's a very, very, very nice idea. Um, now, it's not computationally efficient. I really should have said when I was doing the previous slide, I bothered to point out one of the reasons of even mentioning the randomized protocol. Why, why mention the randomized thing? It's weaker. It's, well, it's not weaker because it's computationally efficient, and this is not. Okay. Um, so their result is still not computationally efficient, but um, I should say the only thing that is not computationally efficient is uh, that we don't know how to build tree codes and we don't know how, to, I'll say exactly what we want um, in, a, in another slide or so. But uh, sort of their contribution is computationally efficient and there's some things that we still don't know how to do that rides on top of their interesting, very interesting questions um, that, would, that could make it uh, possibly efficient. There's a whole list of papers, I don't even think I've got all of them listed here, that have to do with uh, changing this one quarter to different numbers depending on different models of the channels. And won't get into that. Channels and adaptivity to who speaks next, it's a, it's a, it's a bit complicated. Okay, so that's one, one line of research. Um, another line of research that been, people have been developing is um, what exactly is the channel capacity? So, uh, so this was already clear in, in the early 90s. So, so, you know, of course, well, again, I'm going to assume people know, don't, don't so, so if you don't know this stuff, I'm just going to tell you, for most people in the room, I think this is very, very well known. You know, when we talk about one-way communications, if we have a binary symmetric channel or any discrete, any, any sort of noise type of channel, but certainly for a binary symmetric channel, we know exactly what's the maximum rate of communication you can achieve. It has this very pretty uh, representation. It's one minus the log base two entropy of epsilon, the, the, the error probability. And you can communicate at any rate just below that, and you cannot communicate there and above. Um, so we know that. 
Um, but it already seemed um, back in the 90s that that could not be the right answer for interactive communication. Because what happens in interactive communication is you, you, have, um, you have the phenomenon that we've probably all encountered when you talk to someone in a very noisy environment. You start saying something and they say, you know, they, they can tell that they weren't getting things right and they have to ask you to roll back, right? And then you have to, to roll back. And if you don't roll back, they misunderstand what you're saying. And, um, and then, the, from the, then on the communications are kind of wasted. And if you think of the, the branching of a protocol tree where I say something and then depending on what I say, you say something and depending on what I heard, I, you know, you know, it, every player, the next thing that they say depends where they think they are in this protocol tree, right? The problem is if I misunderstand where I am in the protocol tree, what I'm saying is completely irrelevant. I mean, even, even if you later understand that oh, I should ignore that communication, you have to roll back and repeat it. It doesn't convey any useful information that's relevant to the actual way we're going in, the, in, the, in, in our interaction. Whereas in, in one, in, you know, there's not this problem in, in one way communication. It would seem that there's this inherent problem in interactive communications that because there's a, because you need to react, because of the real time problem, because I need, you need when you're responding to react to very recent things, very recent things cannot have been error corrected to very low error probability. Very distant past, you may by now be very sure of. But the last thing that you just said, that you can't possibly have error corrected that very well yet. So I'm going to occasionally misunderstand you. And I'm going to occasionally respond inappropriately, mainly I'm responding about some part of the tree that we shouldn't be even exploring. And then we're going to have to roll back and redo that. Okay, so that's some extra overhead that simply doesn't exist in the, in, for one-way communications. And it seemed um, 20 years ago that that was inherent. Proving that was very hard, uh, but was finally achieved just a few years ago by uh, Gilad Kohl and Ron Raz, where they actually proved that the, for interactive communications, um, instead of the, the one-way bound of one minus the entropy of epsilon being the communication rate, it act, it's actually somewhat worse, and it scales like one minus the square root uh, up to a constant of, uh, of the entropy of epsilon. And they also have a bound from, from, from the other side. But this is really the main, the main accomplishment. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a really kind of, I think, uh, important. So, I mean, we don't, you know, of course, we really only understand this for small epsilon. We don't have the beautiful picture that we have, you know, for all channels, for, for one-way communications, and I don't know. Uh, when we should expect that, but uh, be might be possible. Um, okay, so that's that's uh, uh, that's uh, the, the second direction I want to talk about. The um, the third direction I want to talk about is um, the this issue of computational tractability. So so far, the only situation. I mentioned in which we had something computationally tractable. So we've just been doing with communication complexity. We have been talking about the computation that you need in order to implement the protocol. Was only the case of you know, stochastic channels with randomized protocols, which is like the kindest environment. And other than that, we didn't have anything. But um, in this sequence of papers that were uh, later merged into one, um, Rikursky and Kalei and Orr uh, gave uh, still randomized protocols, but those randomized protocols can deal with an adversarial noise up to a pretty decent threshold, not quite as good as the uh, Braverman route, but still um, pretty high. Um, the computational complexity can be made, okay, there's a slight difference in models here. If you want to really get up to the one over 32, they have yeah, quadratic time computation, but you can get some positive constant even with just with, comp with uh, n log n computation. So it's, it's, um, it's really nice. And uh, interestingly, you know, the same kind of class of ideas work, but it's, it's harder to put them together. It's a lot, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, you still use sort of tree codes for your short-term communications. You can afford that. The problem with tree codes is the computation times scale exponentially in the depth of the tree, but you can get away with this for times proportional to log n, and then you hash as sort of a layer on top of that. And then this was pushed even further along by uh, Bernard Hepler. Uh, I guess about a year or two later, uh, who gave a randomized protocol. <coughs> and he was interested in the low noise regime. Okay, so he's interested in what happens. You know, there's, there's, there's sort of, you know, bad constants sort of, you know, or not that bad, but there are real constants sort of involved sort of any, everywhere in this, in this thing. Oh, I should say, there's an implicit constant that I didn't even talk about here, 
which is the size of the alphabet. Okay, this is like a constant size alphabet, but he was interested in, in you know, also, you know, we want to worry about the whole thing. So he's talking about binary alphabet, uh, which has error, uh, a sm very small, though, error probability. And in that case, he could get, uh, he conjectures this is the right number down to the log log. Um, uh, communication rate. So, so this is kind of a very. This is like the only example I think that we have in um, in in this sort of story that begins to resemble results that we have in classical sort of information theory of where we we you know we really get the right function. It's not quite though because of these constants, but at least the idea is that we're getting the the correct scaling. This and I should say the it's also true of the the cold Ras and in their case too. They have something that looks a little bit different. It's one minus O of the square root of the entropy function. So, th sorry. So, both of those results are results where we think that at least up to, at least the scaling is is really the correct scaling. Is the adversary allowed to be adapted in these randomized protocols, or is it? So that's actually um, a good question. In the um, in the um, in the Gilat in the, the, the cold Ras result, there it's not, and they sort of get the right answer for that. And if you'll notice, there's this curious thing here, which is that he beats their bound. So their bound was square root of the entropy of epsilon, which is growing faster as a function of epsilon. So this number is actually smaller, and that's how he can beat their bound. Because their bound is tight up to constants. The, the, I mean, the second order, this term, is tight up to constants in their bound. But because of adaptivity, he can actually uh, beat their bound. So this is pretty, yeah. Okay. The, 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 the hard work here is actually more the analysis. Uh, it's pretty hard, uh, rather than the protocol, because somehow the protocol still has this structure of the original randomized protocol of you, have a, you, know, you hash at these checkpoints, and you have a binary hierarchy of checkpoints, and you kind of it creates like meeting points for the two parties to, to be hashing the same transcript and then to move forward when they find agreement. It's the same kind of structure. But the impressive thing here is you can actually analyze how that protocol behaves even against an adversary, not just against a, a stochastic channel. OK. Um, and then there's a more recent result that does something, but it's not quite constant rate for even, even the deterministic case. But it's, it's not quite the same kind of result. The direction four I want to talk about is uh, about tree code. So there's somehow there's this important object that's underlying, um, uh, uh, you know, the, everything that's deterministic in this in this story. Um, there have been some, you know, we don't know how to build them. There have been some results I'll, I'll briefly mention. Um, there's an existential after the original existence. These things exist. That's the good thing, uh, but we don't know how to build them. We know how to build them with pretty small alphabets. We know how to build ver variants that don't work for full generality, work for particular classes of applications. We know how to build a weaker object called a potent tree code. Actually, we don't know how to build those, but those at least have the property that if you sample one at random, it will be one. Whereas with tree codes, even if you sample at random, they, are, they aren't one. Um, recently, oh, I should say, I don't think I have it on the slides. There's a very recent kind of unpublished result of Sudan and Yelikalei saying that actually you can get full strength tree codes with high probability too. So this has recently been matched even for tree codes. Um, there's, a, there's a construction that's sort of in quasi-exponential time or whatever you want to call that kind of a function, but the alphabet scales. For, and then there's a conjectural construction uh, by Chris Moore and myself from a couple of years ago, which we don't know if it, it you know, we, which may, may be a construction, depends on some, some conjecture and analytic number theory. Building these, building these is to me the most beautiful open question in this area. It may not be the most important one, to, as I wrote on the slide. To me, it's the most important one. It's certainly the most beautiful. Uh, uh, so I guess it depends a little bit on how much time I have. I have some slides that actually de describe tree codes and the problem here. Uh, but how am I? I have ten minutes. Oh, I can. We can. We can get some coffee and continue then. So we have lots of time. So okay. So I'll, I'll tell you about tree codes, um, just because I'm mentioning them so much. Uh, I'd like, uh, I know some people this is old hat, but not to everyone, I think. So, so what are they? They're, they're a strictly stronger object than a block code. 
um, a, a tree code is this. Uh, let t be the infinite binary tree with root epsilon. So we're going to call root epsilon. It's an infinite binary tree, complete. You know, everybody has two children. <coughs> um, the vertices are labeled by finite strings in 0, 1. So the vertices just tell you 0 it says go left, one, 1 tells you go right, so forth. Okay. And we'll think of this tree as a metric space um, where we take two vertices and we ask about the distance between them. But it's not a standard metric space. We actually only care about the distance between two vertices if they are at the same level. So it's, it's going to be a meaningless question to ask about uh, distance between vertices otherwise. Okay. And uh, the distance between them is just going to be the graph distance, which is the distance, well, or half, which, half the graph distance, or uh, the distance uh, from either of these vertices to their least common ancestor. Okay, so that's the tree, the, the sort of graphical distance between these two points. So in this, I've picked out two favorite vertices, x and y, uh, which are the uh, strings, I guess one means go to the left, 1, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 0, and their distance is 2. Okay, so that's just the tree. There's no code here. Um, if to make this a code, you take some finite alphabet and you write down some letter of the alphabet at every vertex of the, of the tree. Okay? That makes it into a code in the following way. Um, so alpha, alpha is the code. Alpha is a mapping from vertices of the tree into your finite alphabet. Once you have a letter written on every vertex of the tree, you now get words. You, if you start at the root and read down going to some paths, so here you would see A, B, B. Okay? And now you can look at the Hamming distance between two of these words. So for x and y, uh, y was the string a, b, b, x was the string a, c, a. Now what you want this thing, this code, with this, this labeling alpha to satisfy in order for this to be a tree code, is that, that, that these two functions should be roughly the same. So the, the distance uh, on the words it should be the same as the graphical distance in the tree up to a constant factor. Okay, so that makes it a, a, a tree code. So you want the, the, uh, the, the, uh, where is this thing? the Hamming distance between these two words to be at least a constant fraction of uh, S here, where S was the, was the distance uh, at least to the common ancestor. Okay, so that makes this a tree code. Sorry, good question. Um, is, is it, should it be clear that you have a unique decode? I mean, so if I, have an arbitrary labeling of the nodes of the tree mm -hmm. with the alphabet. Is there necessarily a unique distance between the? Because I mean, because there isn't necessarily just one vertex that corresponds to that string over the alphabet. Well, I mean, if you don't have any kind of assumption about the labeling, then I mean, you could just use the. Um, not quite sure I understand the question. Everything can be labeled the same letter. Yeah, yeah I'm not quite sure I understand that. Well, I guess it's more trying to understand. Okay. It's a minute to one mapping in the right direction. So good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. If you're happy, I'm happy. But uh, I can also answer the question if you're not. Uh, oh, but I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Uh, the question was, I think, if there can't be two nodes in the same level, two different nodes that have exactly the same labeling. Well, okay, again, I mean, I could label everything in the tree with the letter A and then, again, nothing. But it wouldn't be a tree code for positive uh, C. So we want some positive C. Um, okay, so uh, old theorem, these things exist. Um, the, it's sort of not quite trivial versions of proofs by the probabilistic method. Um, oh, as I did mention, uh, Kali and Sudan have actually improved as you get high probability. So at the time, it was just there exists with some positive probability, not with overwhelming probability, but now it's been, been fixed. But the problem is that actually we don't even know how to verify it. So, so now, at least thanks to this result of Kali and Sudan, that you could actually generate one, and it's probably fine, and you still can't check it in sub-exponential time. I mean, it's an infinite object, but we always think of like cutting it off at depth n, and um, it's still and it, then it's easy to see that you can check this in exponential time, but we do do not know anything better than that. Okay, so um, so what do I mean by an effective construction? It is an exponential size object, so you can you can argue uh, well. Um, What's the problem with checking in exponential time? It's an exponential size object if I take it down to depth n. The problem is you, know, you only use it for protocols that, that, that run like time n. 
uh, you, so you only explore sort of, you know, vertically. You don't explore the whole breadth of one of these things when you're using them. So what we really mean is that if I give you an address, I give you an address in the tree, you should tell me the label written there in time proportional polynomial in the depth of that vertex. Actually, we want a little bit more to, to really use these things uh, to full strength. If I give you a string of length n, you should be able to find the closest string to it in the tree. Uh, at least, you know, we could do a promise version where there exists something close. Uh, you should want to do that in Tom polynomial time. So if you if you have if you have this, I'll tell you I'll I'll agree you have an effective construction. If you have this, then you can you're really ready to to, to do it. We don't know how to do this. Um, we know how to do lots of other things. For those in, in you know for people who are theoreticians, you know we know about all these like amazing progress has been made, uh, including very recently on Ramsey graphs. You know, there's no and we have no progress that we can demonstrate on this. We only have this one thing that is not obviously false. Okay, that's the status of that. It's a great problem. The fifth uh, kind of research thrust um, that I wanted to talk about is the third scenario, which I didn't mention before, so or I maybe just alluded. Scenario one was um, real-time communications with sort of exogenous data. I'm just still one-way communication, but it's generated in real time. Scenario two is two interacting parties. Scenario three is many interacting parties. And this is perhaps the thing most likely to you know, be connected to maybe some of the application areas related to this workshop. Um, so now the model is I have uh, n processors. They have maybe m point-to-point -point channels. You can imagine other kinds of topologies, obviously. Uh, but this is what people have been worrying about so far. Uh, each channel can carry just one bit per round. Each, um, and this slide, I'm just going to sort of carefully define what the problem statement is. The problem is every processor starts with a private input x sub i. They're solving some problem using a known distributed protocol pi. Um, the way pi works is this. Up till time t, the, the ith processor has some, uh, some transcript. Why, this is no noise, right? I'm just talking about the noise of the situation. Every processor has received some long transcript of everything received from his neighbors up through time t. He batches that all together, and then he applies the protocol. The protocol is a function of his identity, his input, his transcript, and then it says to him what he should send to each of his neighbors. And uh, the protocol has runtime capital T. Was, that's when it, uh, by definition, that's when it's supposed to halt. And uh, the correct output is that every processor should be holding the, at the end of this process, the, this particular transcript Y. Y sub I capital T, okay? And the question is, how can I take a completely generic distributed protocol of this type and protect it against uh, noise? So we did uh, worry about this problem back in the 90s as well um, and had the, the following basic result, which it, there are now improvements of, um, is that, uh, again, for stochastic channels, so every one of these channels is its own binary symmetric channel with some probability epsilon, then you can take the original protocol with ran in, time in, in, ran in time capital T and just slow down by a factor proportional to log n, where n was the number of parties again, okay? And you'll still succeed with exponentially high probability. Or if the network had degree d, then you would slow down by log d. Okay, so log n is just an upper bound. Um, synchronous model, so everything happens sort of, you know, time, all our clocks are synchronized and we just exchange weight messages. It's, um, it's, it's came up in some other workshop recently. So we just mentioned the, the, the flavor of this theorem, it sounds like just a version maybe of the two-party theorem. It actually has a very different flavor from the two-party version. Sort of a, well, you sort of need, obviously, a two-party version, but there's sort of a new phenomenon that happens, which is that when an error occurs, it, has a lot of, it starts propagating through the graph like a, like a wave. And somehow the problem is how to... And you can't stop it, right? Because there are all these ripple effects. Kind of, uh, and you, have to, you can detect that an error has occurred, and then you start sending correction messages. But these things are happening sort of simultaneously all at once. You can easily see that if you slow down um, by, if you, if, you damped, if you did a lot more local error correction, you didn't slow down by a constant uh, loc on each message, you could damp these things so that only a few errors would occur. But the problem is the network's big, and we don't want to slow down like that. So we actually operate in a regime where errors are happening, and, and these waves of error are beginning in the network all the time. 
Um, so, so the interesting thing about this theorem is actually that you have these waves of error corrections chasing waves of errors, and, and you have to show that these things don't add up. Um, so there's something interesting going on. Um, this was um, not uh, um, effective in computation. So a few years ago, there's a quite nice result that showed that you can actually do this in, in with poly time um, computation. But this is still all for stochastic uh, channels. Um, and uh, what we were interested in at the time was this issue of this log n slowdown. So you can see there's something very essentially different between this and the two-party thing, which is that we now have not a constant, but a, a log n uh, uh, hurting us here. Um, and it seemed that that was necessary because of kind of a union bound. I'm sitting here as a processor. I have degree d. There could be an error on every channel coming into me. I just have to take the union over those things happening, so I have to damp the error a bit. Um, and it seemed that that was necessary. It also seemed empirically to be quite a hard problem. It was finally solved uh, just last year, where uh, people showed that, in fact, the distributed case is, there is a real slowdown um, where, well, there's some log log in that we still don't understand, but basically that log in. Is the is the is the correct is the correct answer? This is still all for stochastic channels. Um, this is only the worst case over networks. In fact, it happens for the star network, where there's just one party in the middle, and like a star connected to n neighbors. So that's a network with very high degree but very poor connectivity. Turns out, if you're in a network with high degree but also good connectivity, things are better. And this is thank. Roughly speaking, especially within the context of how much time I have, it's roughly, I'll just say, it's a network coding kind of approach. You sort of broadcast and re reconnect. Um, so you can, you can then get better computation types. Um, OK, just two slides left. Um, people also worry about adversarial noise in the distributed setting. The, the, the truth is sort of much worse. In other words, adversarial noise, you can't get these solutions like what I was just describing. In the ad for adversarial noise, the problem is the adversary can go and focus all of his efforts to destroy the communications coming out of you know, one processor, something that won't happen with stochastic noise. And so the scaling of the th threshold for noise that one can cope with is much, much worse um, uh, in basically one over the number of parties. So that, unfortunately, seems to be the truth. Um, but, uh, but there are results, sort of positive results, up to that level. There's still a lot that we don't understand there. In particular, although the, in particular, there's a slowdown factor there that is probably, to my mind, probably not necessary, which I can describe to people later if, if, they, if, if anyone's curious about these questions. Um, people are looking to a lot of other things. So this is just my grab bag of, of other, other kinds of this of cryptograph, you know, the effects of noise and communications in cryptographic settings people have looked at. People have looked at what happens for channels with uh, insertions and deletions, so channels where, where time is not synchronous for the different parties. Um, uh, we're currently working at what happens, sort of a rate distortion version of these types of theorems. And um, what I uh, decided not to focus on at all in this talk, uh, sort of knowing that I wouldn't have time to and also that I'm really not an expert in it, is the, the, the role of communication distributed control. It's clearly the thing that's you know, most obviously connected to, er to everything I've talked about. Um, uh, and hopefully one of, I just mentioned a few of the names of, of control theorists who've been sort of interested in the role of communication, uh, information and control, and uh, maybe we'll hear at some point now or next year, I don't know, from some of these people. Okay. okay, thank you very much. No, Danny had a... Yeah, always a bit confused. So we, uh, there's the problem of the streaming k means, for example. Yeah. I have got k points, and I want to send information to these gauss and noise between us. And you need to recover the k points in some sense. This is streaming k means important. And we never mentioned this kind of results, and they never mentioned causes. And I wonder, what is, is there any connection? Because the, the problem sounds a bit... Similar, we have, uh, I have information, there is noise, I want to send you these this vectors, but it seems to we have nothing to do with information theory, although the problem seems a bit relevant. But why is this? I mean, what am I missing here that... Uh 
So you know, sorry, but just you know, you know, K, you know the K sources exactly, and they, they get. I sent it to you. The, uh, I just sent yeah. one. I sent it to you, but there's gobs of noise. So well, again, it. it's it's a one-way problem. You have all the information, and I don't. And uh, you know, you can think of it as a rate distortion problem if you, if you like, and if you want to get approximate locations, if you want to, if you digitize this and want to send them exactly, it becomes a standard coding theory problem. You know, we know that. Uh, interaction doesn't change capacity for one-way communications. It's, it's, so, so it can help co computation, but it doesn't actually change capacity. So these things come in, though, though where, uh, you know, take some version of a problem where you have K points and I have L whatevers, and, the, and then, then, the, then the interaction the becomes slide, important. Like the, for the first slides, we're about channel with noise, and we just want to send you some information. Yeah, but... The first slide is not, yeah. yeah. The other 19 slides, you know, the other yes. problems. <laughs> yeah. so is there any work on um, sort of looking at the, the error correction blow up in this last setting for specific functions? For obviously, for majority, you can do much better than parity, I, mean, I would imagine, or something. Like, I see. Anything like that? So I'm afraid, okay, and the noise. Uh, uh, I see. You want to say that some of these functions are just much more robust to the channel noise, maybe. Um, the the only okay. So the only thing I, I can think of that's at all similar to that was this paper I went by very quickly, uh, by um, that uh, Rabani Ostrovsky and Swami and myself, where we say for particular problems in control. Uh, but we're not in the unstable regime of control. We're sort of in the in the borderline case in control. So we have we have a plant that doesn't. It's not actively unstable. It's neutrally stable. Uh, in that case, the problem you're solving doesn't have this exponential growth growth of like a tree code. So the, so the sorry the protocol. Never mind the code. The pro, the protocol geometry doesn't look like a tree. It actually looks like a finite dimensional space. So that's kind of a gentle kind of problem to be solving. And in that case, we can do better. We have, you know, computationally effective solutions to these problems. Um, doesn't exactly fit the example, but that's the only example I'm aware of where we have a result of that flavor. So I'm wondering about the connection between these, these uh, interactive codes and, uh, and distributed consensus algorithms. And just if I can elaborate slightly, that's why I mean this on a Leslie Lamport, right? Where in the distributed consensus algorithm, what you what you really strive for is not to get the probability of error below some threshold, but to get the probability of error to be zero. And it seems like there's a natural trade-off here between the time required to accomplish that versus the probability of error. So it seems like you know you could trade off the time dimension against the probability of error. You get approximate consensus using these kinds of algorithms or exact consensus by trading off the use of time. Has anyone looked at the relationship between these algorithms? Well, well let, me, let me make sure I'm understanding. So, I'm not sure I understand that. Is the question, could we more quickly get a much, um, um, something without exponential error probability? Um, get the probability of error to zero at the, at the expense that the time it takes to accomplish the communication may become unbounded, but you could bound it with some probability, yeah. right? So guarantee exact communication, but bound the time it takes to accomplish that with some error probability. Uh, oh, I see. You want the zero error but randomized time version of these yeah. kinds of results. No, so so I think usually there's, it should be like a pretty automatic way of, of sort of compiling, well, it depends what kind of channel model you're talking about. I mean, if the channels are stochastic, then your error probability is, is, is just never going to be zero because no, maybe every bit has been corrupted. Uh, or, you know. that's, that's not true because you can, I mean, you can trade off time against this. This is what the distributed... Okay, in the limit, okay, so, so you can say that... Like T over 3 could to bounce on where the, the source of failure? Yeah, yeah, sure. There, I, that, so, that, that? so the question is, if you, if you bound the sources of error, so like at most... One third of the parties. That, that's the adversarial model. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so, but many of the results I described were, were precisely about the adversarial model of error, where I say the adversary has only flipped alpha fraction of the bits. And then we, we said there are these thresholds, so if the fraction was less than one quarter, then the probability of error is zero. Uh, so the, the, so that, that's what we know in this kind of a, a setting. So, can I just, um, I, 
I, I had a go looking at precisely that thing. I was interested, what's the performance of the Lamport consensus algorithm versus some other consensus algorithm? And, and what you're, you're bringing up is that the uh, measurement of complexity that people want, who the people who design the distributed algorithms are interested in one notion of complexity. It seems to me that the people designing communication algorithms are interested in a different notion of complexity. So I was, I was interested in, I mean, well, what's the real killer when you're trying to write a distributed algorithm? Number one, round trip times. Number two, packet drop. So I, you, you, you can take, let's say, the Lamport consensus algorithm and say, what are the asymptotics of this algorithm as a, a function of P, the packet drop probability, parameterized by RTT, the round trip time, and you can say, this algorithm has such and such a complexity in terms of P and RTT. And you could do the same with, let's say, um, um, the Lamport clock algorithm and ask how tight is the clock bounds as a function of, of network connectivity. So, so the, the error model that makes sense for people writing distributed algorithms, I think, is to say, don't, don't worry about adversaries, because there aren't adversaries when you're saying packets on the internet, at least. I mean, there are, but, but not, not, not in this sense. Your adversary is generally, it, it, it's generally a, a packet drop because buffers get full and packet latency because of, of routing variability. Your, your, your crucial question is how robust is my algorithm to those sorts of error? And then, then it's really fascinating to ask, how can I come up with a measurement of complexity where, where different algorithms really, you, you showcase the difference, you work out the brittle points of this algorithm versus that algorithm. And, yeah, you know, you, I think you raise another point which triggers another question in my mind, which is that the, you know, your notion of interactivity has more to do with how much data you get before you reply, but it doesn't have to do with the latency of the communication. But the latency of the communication could be a killer problem. You know, for your, yeah, uh, yeah, that's been assumed away here. Everything gets there in one unit of time. I totally agree. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, it would be good to look. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, thank you.